let's write it down. Okay, so we'll, we'll do both of them, but we'll do the one you just said first. Okay, so there was an example that you wanted me to do. It was to compute the derivative of what expression? Over 2x plus 2. Yeah? Okay, so then this is a quotient, so you should use the quotient rule. Alternatively, alternatively, right, you could say that this is equal to the derivative, the derivative of <coughs> 7 halves times x plus 1 over x plus 1. So then now, x plus 1 over x plus 1, this function right here that, that was given, notice that this expression is not defined where? At x, at x is negative 1. So then because the function is not defined there, right, if there's, that means there's not a point on the graph there, and that means that there's not a tangent line there because you can't attach a tangent line to a graph at that point. And so what does that mean about the derivative? If you have a function that is not defined at a point, what about its derivative? It also is not defined there, right? So then, you know, when you compute a derivative, right, the domain has to be inside of the domain of the original function, right? The domain can't be, get bigger. Okay, so then for these reasons, this is just going to be equal to, <coughs> this is equal to, this is equal to the derivative of 7 halves times 1, and the, that cancellation is possible because x cannot be negative 1. Okay, so then this is a constant. So what's the derivative of a constant? Zero. Right, so then the derivative of this function is zero everywhere except negative one where it doesn't have a definition. Okay, so then if you were to plot the derivative of this function, it would look like so. Okay, so then <coughs> we'll make a big fat one like that. So it's equal to zero everywhere except negative 1 where it doesn't have a definition. So I'll, I'll say that's negative 1 right there. Oop. So it sort of looks like that. Okay? Alternatively, right, just as an alternative matter, you could have used the quotient rule and said that This is going to be equal to 7x plus 7 derivative times 2x plus 2 minus 7x plus 7 times uh, 2x plus 2 derivative all over 2x plus 2 squared, right, that's the quotient rule. Okay, so then this, in turn, right, will be 7 multiplied by 2x plus 2 minus 7x plus 7 multiplied by 2 over 2x plus 2 squared. Okay, so then now you multiply out and collect like terms, you get 14x plus 14 minus 14x minus 14 over 2x plus 2 squared. And so that's exactly equal to 0 over 2x plus 2 squared. And that is equal to, <coughs> that is equal to 0 when x is not negative 1. Okay? Any other questions concerning this one? 
Okay, so yeah, then right. now, this was <clears throat> right, given two numbers A and B show, as a mathematician would write it, this. A is less than B plus epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero implies that A is less than or equal to B. Okay, so then that's a symbolic way to write that statement that I wrote. Okay, so you want to show this is true. <coughs> so then if I call if I call this proposition P and I call this proposition Q, right, so then what you are tasked to do is to show that P implies Q. That P implies Q. Now from a mathematician's point of view, right, there is an equivalence here. P implies Q. There is an equivalent statement, which is this one. Uh, not Q. So not Q implies what? implies what? Not P, right? So, we have statements here. So what are we going to do? The way we're going to go about solving this is we are going to <coughs> do the following. We're going to assume we're going we're going to be given P, right? The problem says that P is true. We're going to assume not Q. And we're going to arrive at a contradiction. So this is a very uh, common math, math argument. So it's going to say, OK, these, these are the conditions that were given to me. And I want to show that that is true. So I'm going to assume it's not true. And then I'm going to go through the machinery until I arrive at something that says that, well, the thing that you gave me must not have been true in the first place. But that's a contradiction. So then the only thing that could, that w could possibly be right is my assumption that, that not Q was true is actually false. Okay? Good. So then, we're going to assume we're going to assume the logical negation of A is less than or equal to B. So what is the logical negation of A is less than or equal to B? A is greater than B. Right, that's the logical negation. If, right, so then the statement is A is less than or equal to B. So then the negation of that is that A is greater than B. That's the negation. Okay, so we'll assume the negation. So A is greater than B. <coughs> so now what? Someone give me an idea. Sorry? Uh, you you could, but I don't see why I don't see why it would help. How it would help. Okay, so then how about this? I'll say A is greater than B. That's just me copying it down. I just copied down that previous statement. So now I can say, how about this? A minus B is greater than what? Zero. A minus B is greater than zero. <coughs> so I can say that a minus B over 2 is greater than 0. And because all I did was divide by 2. And so now, I will leave you here, and I want you to think about what epsilon equal to A minus B over 2 would mean. Right? Because remember what the statement is. The statement says it has to work for every epsilon. Not for some epsilon, but for every epsilon. 
Okay, so then if we assume the negation, if we assume that a is greater than b, then a minus b over 2 has to be positive, which means that epsilon could be that. Right? Because epsilon can be anything positive. So consider what would happen if epsilon was that. And if you go through the motions, maybe draw a, di draw a line, a number line, or maybe make some algebraic statements, you'll arrive at some wonderful condition like 1 is less than 0, right, which is false. Okay, so you arrive at a false statement, and then the only, c the only conclusion you can make is that, ah, my assumption that A was greater than B was false. Therefore, the negation of that statement has to be true. Therefore, A is less than or equal to B. Yes? Yeah, but it's, it, they're, not a, they're not equivalent. They, they, you, they can be less. So, for example, if you take A is 0 and B is 1, it's still true. And 0 is not equal to 1. Well, I'm, sh I'm certain that there's uncountably infinitely many ways to show it. <laughs> but th this way is the shortest way. Yeah, through contradiction would be the easiest way that I can think of. Okay, so then think about what that would mean. And then you will arrive at some lovely contradiction. Okay, other questions before we continue? Other questions? I'm recording, right? Yes. Okay. So we're in section 2.4, which is really the important section. It's called the chain rule. So then up until now, we've talked about lots of rules for derivatives. Right, so then let's review them real quick. We had this one. What if you compute the derivative of a constant? What do you get? Zero, right? Because a constant is a horizontal function, right? It's completely flat. Its slope is zero, so the slopes of its tangent lines are zero, so its derivative is zero. Another thing that we did was this. The derivative of x to the n is n multiplied by x to the n minus 1. And the way we did this, the way we did this is we, we only demonstrated it for positive integers, and we used the binomial theorem to do it. Right. But I told you, promised you, that it's actually true for any n. Right? Positive, negative, fractions, whatever. <coughs> okay, good. So then, what's another rule we know? The sum rule, right? So if you take f of x plus g of x or minus, right, this is... I'll write it with the prime notation, f prime of x plus g prime of x. Okay, so then what's another one? Maybe just to mix it up, I'll use this notation now. How about uv prime? What's the name of the rule for this one? Yes, that's, that, that's it, but that is the formula, but what is the name of this rule? The product rule, good. And then, right, u over v prime. Well, that can be u prime v minus u v prime over v squared. Okay, so we've got a bunch of rules. <coughs> so the rule for the derivative of a constant is called the constant rule. Right, oh, there's one, there's one other rule which I'll write up here. It is this. Right, the derivative of c f of x, where c is a constant, is c f of x, like that. So the derivative of a constant, that's called the constant rule. This, if you take a constant and multiply it, the way the derivative acts with it is called the constant multiplier rule. If you consider powers x to the n, the derivative rule is called the power rule. 
If you consider the sum of functions, the derivative rule is called the sum rule. The product of functions, product rule. Quotient of functions, quotient rule. So there's something else that you can do with functions besides these things that I've written here. Something that you can't do with numbers, because you, we can do all of these things with numbers, right? You can take two numbers and add them and get a number. You can take two numbers and multiply them and get a number. You can take two numbers, and so long as the denominator is not zero, you can divide them and get a number. But there's something you can do with functions that you can't do with numbers, and what is that? Starts with C. Compose, right? You can compose functions. You cannot compose numbers. Okay, so then the rule for products is the product rule, the rule for sums is the sum rule, the rule for quotients is the quotient rule, blah, 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 blah. So what's the rule for compositions? The chain rule. <laughs> Who came up with that name, right? Who did that? I don't know, I wasn't there. If I was there, it was hundreds of years ago. If I was there, I probably would have said, hey guys, seriously, what are we doing? Okay, so then <clears throat> we have the chain rule. This is the rule, the derivative rule, for composition of functions. <coughs> okay, so given this is the way the book writes it. Also, I'll write it like this. Y is f of u, and u is g of x, so that you could write y is f of g of x, like so. So you can see that y is the composition of functions. y is a function of x because it is f of g of x. So given these things, given these things, <coughs> you can see that y is a function of x. So you should be able to compute its derivative with respect to x. Its derivative is this, dy dx is equal to dy du multiplied by du dx. OK, so now. Before we do anything else, I'd like to make some comments. So then these look like fractions, right? That looks like dy divided by dx, okay? But they're not fractions for a variety of reasons that we will get into as the semester goes on. Now, the notation to make them look like fractions is chosen on purpose, okay? And this, is, this right here, what we're looking at is the reason why. So look at the right-hand side of this. If these were fractions, they're not, but if they were, you could perform a cancellation. What cancellation? Right, the du's would cancel. And what would you get if you canceled the du's? dy over dx, right? Okay, wonderful. So then now, this right here, this symbol means the derivative of y with respect to what? u. Okay, whereas this other one right here means the derivative of what with respect to what? Right, u with respect to x. Okay, and this last one over here, this means the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay. <coughs> okay. So then, as a matter of notation, you could write it like this. The derivative of f of u Right, so here it is, we're saying, we're computing the derivative with respect to x of a function of u. 
and u might itself be a function of x somehow, then you could write it like this. It is f prime evaluated at u multiplied by du dx. Or, there's so many notations. <laughs> f prime of u multiplied by u prime. Okay, and then finally, <laughs> even another notation. Part of the problem is, is that the derivative notion for science and mathematics is so powerful, it has been in the hands of many, many, many groups for a long time and was developed simultaneously in different places, so there's all different ways to write it. So it can be written f prime evaluated at g of x multiplied by g prime of x. Okay, and this is called the chain rule. <coughs> okay, now, let's do a couple quick examples just so you understand what this computation means just from a computational point of view, and then I want to try and describe to you what this is actually saying. Okay, so an example. I could ask for you to compute. I could, I could give you y is the sine of 2x. y is the sine of 2x. Now, from, from a previous lecture, from a previous lecture, we said that we could do the following. We could say, well, y is 2 sine of x cosine of x. Now, how did I do that? That's a trig identity. Okay, so then from there, I could say that, well, now I can compute dy dx using what? The product rule, right? So I could say that this is 2, uh, two cosine of x, cosine of x, plus 2... Uh, sine of x, no, minus. So, well, I'll say plus. Plus 2 sine of x times negative sine of x, like so, and then say that dy dx is 2 cosine of x squared minus, sin, uh, minus 2 sine of x squared. Okay, but what is, after you factor out the 2, you get cosine squared minus sine squared. Now, what is that? What is cosine squared minus sine squared? Cosine of 2x, right? So this is 2 cosine of 2x. That's from a previous lecture. Right, so then we were able to arrive here we were able to arrive here by using a trig identity. But what if I made it like, instead of y is sine of 2x, what if I said y is sine of 44x? Right? <laughs> if I can put a 2 there, I can put a 44 there. So then would you use the trig identity, <laughs> that same trig identity, you know, 12 times or however many times it takes it to get, to get it down? <laughs> no, right? That wouldn't be good. You don't want to do that. Okay, so then instead we're going to use the chain rule. So now with the chain rule, we know that if I take y is the sine of u and u is 2x, right, if you take y is the sine of u and u is 2x, then According to the chain rule, dy dx will be, the derivative of sine is what? Cosine evaluated at u, and then for the chain rule, I need to multiply by u prime. I need to multiply by u prime. So then, now, what is u prime in this problem? 2. So it will be cosine of u multiplied by 2, and then now I'll substitute u. 
dy dx is the cosine of 2x multiplied by 2. So the, did we get the same answer? Got the same answer. So now, now, what if I, instead of making it sine of 2x, I make it the sine of, if I want you to compute the derivative of, say, the sine of 44x. Well, now it's a straightforward application of the chain rule because it will be the derivative of sine is cosine, and then evaluated at 44x. And then for the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of the things that were inside, so the derivative of 44x. And so then what is the derivative of 44x? 44. So this is the cosine of 44x times 44. <coughs> So any question about this? Okay. Let's continue. So how about how about uh, this one? We'll compute the derivative of say the square root of x squared plus one. So now, it sort of helps when you're doing these to write down the pattern of what's happening. The pattern, as I see it here, is we are computing the derivative of the square root of u. And the derivative of the square root of u for some u. Okay, this, right, would be 1 over 2 the square root of u because you took my advice and, and memorized the derivative of the square root. But this is not all. Right? What is missing from my statement here? Multiply by u prime. And if you like, right, you could just write u prime over 2 square root u if that is better for you. Okay, so does everyone see that that's the pattern that, we're, that we have to do for this? Okay, so then this will be 1 over 2 square root x squared plus 1, and then for the chain rule, multiply by x squared plus 1 derivative. Okay, so we're halfway there. My commas look like... That's a comma. That's a prime. Okay, so then now, this will be 1 over 2 the square root of x squared plus 1, multiplied by, what's the derivative of x squared plus 1? 2x. And as far as I'm concerned, you can leave it just like that. I know that some of you have some sort of even salivary response at seeing those two over two there. And if you just can't stand it to be there, then you can cancel it. That's fine. But I personally don't care. Okay. So any question concerning this one? Any question? All right. So how about, for example, yes, uh, the derivative, the derivative of the sine of the square root of, how about, 3x plus 5. Okay, now. I want you to write the pattern here. So then you can see that I sort of have a pattern here that I put right here. I want you to write the analogous pattern right here in this position. And so that is to say, I want you to write this is the derivative of only the outermost function and then u. <coughs> so what is the outermost function? sine, right? So then this is, in our current position, it is the sine of u, right? So then that is going to be cosine of u multiplied by u prime. And that's the pattern here. All right. So then it will be cosine of the square root of 3x plus 5, and then multiplied by the derivative of the square root of 3x plus 5. 
like so. Cosine u, u prime. OK, now, the cosine term at the front is now finished. It requires no further modifications whatsoever. But are we finished computing the derivative? No. No, we are not finished computing the derivative. So now we have a new pattern that is here. So what derivative pattern are we doing now? The derivative of what is what? The square root of u, right? That's what we're trying to, to do here. So this will be 1 over 2 square root u. And then for the chain rule, what's missing? u prime. So that's what we're doing here now on this line. So then I'd like for you to see what happened here. So this is significant. We used the chain rule once. And now we're using what? The chain rule again. So here's a question where I've given you. I forced you to use the chain rule twice. So understand what that means. That means that if I can force you to use the chain rule twice, then I can force you to use it arbitrarily many times. Right? I could make it 15 times. OK, but let's be realistic. Okay, on a quiz or an exam, am I going to make you use the chain rule 15 times? No, for a very simple reason. I don't want to grade it. <laughs> right? I don't want to grade it. <laughs> you don't want to do it. I don't want to grade it. Okay, it's not going to happen. OK, but twice? Oh, yeah. Twice is fine. OK, so then this will be cosine. 3x plus 5, and then multiplied by 1 over 2, the square root of 3x plus 5, and then multiplied by 3x plus 5, derivative. Now, invariably at this point, some student wants to raise their hand and say, but I just wanted to write 3. Okay, that's fine, but it's sort of a bad habit, and I see students mess it up all the time. Okay, why would that? Why would this hypothetical student just want to write three? Because that's the derivative that, that I'm eventually going to write on this line. And so one over two square root three x plus five, and then multiplied by three. Okay, so any question about this response? This answer. This last line, yeah, OK. So then now, this last line is the derivative. What I have written here, this is the answer. All right, this is what's being graded. So then I'm not so interested if you can jump from beginning to end right, without, it, without displaying any intervening work. The point is that we want to see this intervening work because we want to see that this machinery is in your head turning in the proper way. If you don't write anything down, then there's nothing to grade, and we can't assign any points. OK? I know that four lines of work seems like a lot <laughs> to you, because I'm a human, I know. OK? But uh, it's what is being graded. Other questions? OK, now, so I can make you use the chain rule arbitrarily many times. Now, you should avoid the chain rule if you can. So just like this example right here, right, I gave you this example a couple days ago. So if you get in a hurry, you might think, oh, how will I compute the derivative of this product? I'll use the product rule. And you could. That would be fine. Except. You'd have to use the product rule and then collect like terms and blah, 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 blah. Alternative, alternatively, it would be far better for you to do this, right? To say that this is the derivative of x to the 5, which is 5x to the 6. And that's far better than having used the product rule. Similarly, right, I can say, well, how about x to the 7 over x to the 2? 4, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, <coughs> my brain's wandering. OK, so then now, for this expression, for this expression, you could use the what? You could use the quotient rule. That would be a perfectly acceptable thing to do. But 
it will be more convenient for you to simply say that this is also the derivative of x to the 5, which is 5x to the 4, <laughs> not 5x to the 6. Right? So then, now, the general, what this generally is falling under, what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that if you see an algebraic simplification, you should do it before you compute the derivative. Right? You shouldn't wait. Okay. Now, with that context, please compute the following derivative. The derivative of the fifth root of x squared plus 1 to the 4. Okay, so then on the one hand, on the one hand, you could take it this way. You could say that, okay, what I'm doing is I'm computing the derivative of something that looks like u to the one-fifth. Right, because, why one-fifth? Because that's the fifth root, right? Fifth root is fractional exponent one-half. And this would be, this would be one-fifth u to the negative four-fifths multiplied by u prime you could take it in this direction. That would be a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Now, then to compute the u prime, to compute u prime, you would, you would look at something that looks like v to the fourth. And then you would compute its derivative and say, well, that's 4v to the 3 multiplied by v prime. So then you would have used the chain rule twice, right? This way you would have used the chain rule once. Uh, once and then again, so two times. Okay, now, is there some way that we can get away, that we can eliminate the use of one of the chain rules? Yes. So then I can say, well, there, I see an algebraic simplification I can make here. I can say that this is the derivative of, in steps, I can say that this is x squared plus 1 to the 4 to the 1 fifth. Right? And then I see iterated exponents. Iterated exponents are combined with multiplication. So this is the derivative of x squared plus 1 to the 4 fifths. OK, so then now, if you use this algebraic expression, then, then you will get the exact same derivative, except, except you'll only have to use the chain rule once. So this will be 4 fifths x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 fifth multiplied by what? The derivative of x squared plus 1 for the chain rule. Okay, so then this will be 4 fifths x squared plus 1 to the negative 1 fifth times 2x. So any question about this? <coughs> Don't care. <laughs> I do not care. Right, so then if the... There, in very special and rare circumstances, I'll say, please simplify it in the following manner. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so in very rare circumstances, I'll say, please simplify it in this way. And it's usually because if I don't explicitly say simplify it in this way, it becomes a nightmare for the greater. So, other questions before we do one more and then look at the geometric reason for the chain rule. Okay. So, one more is this. How about the derivative of... I don't know. Let's think about this for a minute. How about, how about the square root... of, 
I don't know, x cubed times tangent of x. That sounds like pretty good. <coughs> so I can't think of any, uh, of any physical phenomena that would be modeled by this, but that's fine. <laughs> so in order to do this, we will need the chain rule. Okay, so then the, r the pattern here that we're using is the derivative of u is 1 over 2 square root u. And then for the chain rule, multiplication by u prime. Okay, so then this will be like so. It will be 1 over 2 the square root of x cubed tangent x multiplied by x cubed tangent x prime. Right, so does everybody agree on this position? Okay, so then now what will we be using? Yes, <laughs> what rule will we have to use to compute the derivative of this product? The product rule, right? So the purpose of this example is to illustrate something to you. I made you use the chain rule and then the product rule. So understand what this means. This means that I have nested them, these rules in this way. Understand that it means I can, I can nest these arbitrarily. And I can say, I can give you a problem where you have to use the quotient rule and then the chain rule and then the product rule and then the quotient rule again. Okay, so in reality, right, it probably won't ever be like that because I wouldn't want to grade such a thing, but, you know, making you use the chain rule and the product rule, the product rule and then the chain rule, the quotient rule and, the, and then the product rule, mixing these rules up, it's going to happen. Okay, so then <coughs> 1 over 2, the square root of x cubed tangent x, and then now the product rule, 3x squared tangent x, plus x cubed, and what's the derivative of tangent? Secant of x squared. Okay. So any question about this? <coughs> any question? Okay, everybody feeling good about this? Okay, so then, so are there any questions before we start looking at a diagram? Uh, we just have enough time to look at it. We'll look at it and then finish it on Wednesday. So any questions? Any questions? Well, let's just do one more example and I'll just start the diagram on Wednesday since there's only two minutes. <coughs> okay. So, how about... Oh yeah, that looks wonderful. So then why is x divided by the square root of x squared plus 4. Okay, so then you want to I want you to compute the derivative. Okay, so then dy dx. So first things first, what will we be doing? The quotient rule. Right, the quotient rule. That's the very first thing because y is in this form, right, u over v. That's the form it's in. So dy dx is, is going to take the form u prime v minus u v prime over v squared. Okay, so then it will be 1 times the square root of x squared plus 4 minus x times 1 over <coughs> the square root of x squared plus 4. And then let's think about this 2 here. Right? 2 multiplied by the derivative of x squared plus 4. And then all of that over the square root of x squared plus 4. squared. Okay, so then I've obviously used the quotient rule here, but I also use the chain rule. Where? 
right this part right here this right, that's the chain rule so then to finish this up I can say that well this is equal to the square root of x squared plus 4 and then minus what x times 1 over 2 the square root of x squared plus 4 times 2x over x squared plus 4. Okay, so any question about this? The only purpose of this example is to show you an example where you have to use the chain rule and the quotient rule. So, and understand that, so I have a question for you. The chain rule and the quotient rule were both used. Which one was used first? The quotient rule. Could I have used them in the other order? No, not now. Right, so I can give you a problem where you have to use the quotient rule and then the chain rule. I can give you a problem where you have to use the chain rule and then the quotient rule. Okay, so you have to pay very co close attention to these things. See you on Wednesday. <coughs>